My son. Good afternoon and welcome to Focus Africa series. My name is Success Bright, your popular host. And today on this beautiful show, I have all the way from Podako City in Nigeria, Reverend Ugochuku Onachuku. Welcome to this series, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Success. Um, it's such a pleasure to be part of uh, at this project, and I'm sure that our conversation today is going to make a whole lot of difference. I bring new light and also glorify God. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming. It's really a great privilege hosting somebody like you on this show today. So Focus Africa series is brought to you by Business Day Media, and we're very, very happy that you're joining us today on this broadcast that is showing live across the continent of Africa. Um, Focus Africa series tells the authentic stories of the struggles, the challenges, and the success stories of individuals and brands across Africa. We've hosted quite a number of high-profile individuals on this show already, and today promises to be even better. So we'll get right into the discussion today. We don't like to waste your time on this series. We like to go straight into the stories and then share our perspectives from our guests. So today we'll be looking at religion and governance, the role of church. And like I told you, I have my guest already in the building. He has introduced himself. I will go right into this discussion today. So just before we go right into this discussion, I'd like to tell you um, a little about my guest. I will not be able to take all his profile because it's quite very long. So today I have Reverend Ugochuku Nachuku in this studio today. He is a distinguished scholar, a priest, and a consultant. He studied at Agar State University, University of Chichester, West Success, England, and Bible College, where he was trained in business management, applied theology and sociology at postgraduate level in addition. He holds two honorary doctorate degrees in divinity and missions from the, from the US and Israel. He is a certified John Maxwell leadership trainer. He is the president of Sky Leadership and Entrepreneurship Academy. Promoters of Project 5000, a global entrepreneurship leadership initiative for the kingdom. This project have promoted about 255 people who have become millionaires in the last one year in Port Harcourt alone. He is an ex-banker, ex-bank manager, and has also been part of advancing professionalism and labor in this country by serving as the Secretary of Chartered Institute of Bankers East and Chairman of Chapter of Bankers Trade Union at various times. He has also served as the Chief of Staff to the military governor of Imo State. He is an author, television, and radio host with tremendous scholarship. He is the patron of several organizations, including NUJ and Actors Guild of Nigeria South East Zone, where he is presently the grand patron. Reverend Nugutku is a scout commissioner in River State. He is the senior pastor Recovery House Church with branches in several continents of the world. He is the president of Global Ministerial Education Licensing and Monitoring Board Networks, called ICOM Ministerial Network. He is also a healing and deliverance minister, international conference speaker, and mentor of several successful people around the globe. He is married to Pastor Ugochi Onatsuku and has several children. He is also my father. So ladies and gentlemen, help me. Um, we're already here, so we have welcome Reverend, and we'll go right into the discussion. That's his profile right there. So Reverend, good morning once again, and welcome, sir. Thank you very much, success. All right, sir, today, so we're discussing religion and governance, the role of church in nation building. And since you are a Christian, we would like to take most of our discussion from your religious perspective. We're also gonna to touch um, other aspects of religion as it, um, regarding other faith and other, but today, majorly, we're going to be looking at the religious aspect of this discussion, um, the Christian aspect of this discussion. So let me start by asking you, Reverend, 
in a more globally diverse religion, um, Christian, Christianity is a more globally diverse religion in the world. Um, recently, a Pew Research identified 10 countries with the largest Christian population in, in 2015, with Nigeria, Republic of Congo, and Ethiopia dominating, apart from the US, the Russia, and a few others. But in these same countries, talking about African countries, with a lot of religious people, crime rates and social vices are on the increase. Sir, can you explain why the church is overwhelmed at a time like this? Well, the issue is matching development and spirituality, matching crime rate and faith. Uh, there are three ways to look at uh, why the church is being overwhelmed. Number one is numerical strength the number of churches, the number of people that are going to church in a particular country does not reflect spirituality. In the Christian faith, numbers are very insignificant. We don't look at numbers. So you could have two million professed Christians in the country. But actually, those who are Christians, those who are godly, it's just a minute fraction. So the overwhelming factor is indicative of very low quality spirituality. It's indicative of um, spirituality that has not been able to triumph. So because when faith triumphs, it eats up everything around it. Remember the encounter between, uh, between Moses and the snakes. So that mystery actually explains the move of the church. The snakes of Pharaoh's magicians were more. The attack was more. And there was only one snake from the kingdom. And that snake was able to swallow all of them. So that little mystery explains the overwhelming uh, nature of crime. If Moses had brought a snake that was uh, not as empowered as it were at that time, it would have happened. So the church is, uh, the church is not influencing the society because uh, the fabric of the church is weak. Spirituality is not deep enough. And uh, until we rise to the occasion, we will continue to face the embarrassment. Then the second thing about the overwhelming nature uh, of crime, when you match it with uh, the growing faith, uh, growing spirituality, growing numbers of the church, is actually uh, something that is sovereign to God. God is the God of seasons. God is the God of all knowing. At times, and you need to understand this, he allows a situation for a purpose. Um, I was teaching about uh, the pillar of cloud and fire not too long ago globally. And you could see that God allowed Pharaoh, allowed Egypt to overwhelm Israel. And he says, I allowed it to show my glory. So it could be a season where God is setting up something that will glorify his name. So these are the two contexts where you see this happen. And I'm sure that's what we're experiencing right now in this country and around the world. See, that before most of my viewers who might not really know you, I, I need to lay an uh, emphasis on where you're coming from so that they will understand. We know you as someone um, who is a spiritual man and also a man with wisdom. In fact, uh, down here in Lagos, we used to say the uh, church um, whose wisdom is built. So we already know you as, so uh, you've achieved so much too early in life. What's your secret? And of course, the multitasking. You do a lot of things. So what is the secret to your success? Okay, I, I will start from the multitasking, then I go back. Now, new creation is not embattled when new creation is seen in. Because the righteousness of faith empowers us to actually be in control, 
even when we are struggling with certain things in life. The, the, the worst thing that happens to new creation is underutilization of your profile. It is, it, is, it is appalling for new creation to do one thing. I mean, new creation is configured to do too many things at a time. So until believers begin to understand what they became when Christ redeemed them, one man, you know, who was doing just a few things. Remember, Paul of uh, Tarsus was called Paul. Was called, uh, Saul of Tarsus was called Paul. I mean, he was a rabbi, a bit of soldiering. That was all he was doing. But when he had this experience, he screamed, I can do all things. So that's number one. I must ask because I have a supernatural ability that makes me like a jack of all trades and master of all. And then number two, you made it so early. I've been asked this question a lot of times. My so you know, one of my most quoted words of wisdom is early light, early flight. Early light, early flight. Catch the light early, you fly. You know my history. By 25, I was already a bank manager. Um, by 19, I made my first million. By 30, I was already chief of staff. By 33, this global ministry was already in place. So what happened was, not anything. I didn't come from a, a, a powerful, rich background. My father was uh, an Anglican church catechist that died when I was 11. That's why I tell people that your background is not the ground for your future success. What is the light that you receive? So it didn't stop with some encouraging everybody, catch the light. You know, in Genesis 1, the Bible says God made lesser lights and bigger lights. Go for the real light. Isaiah screamed, who are these that fly by light? So if you catch that light early, that light is not age sensitive. I mean, Joseph caught it at 17. You saw what he did. Um, Jesus was on that light. Um, a lot of people were on that light um, um, over time. So even my children, all of you, you could see my emphasis from day one has been wisdom and light. It gives you wings and you, you hit levels too early in life. I'm not just getting there, but staying there. Beautiful. This is amazing. Now, the earlier you were explaining why the church is overwhelmed in the face of the crisis, the rising cases of crimes and all that. So you, you did mention the timing and also the level of involvement of Christians. I want to ask you, what is the ideal response of faith in this context? Exactly. Uh, let me say something that I've been wanting to talk about and I thank God for this uh, particular platform because uh, the church has come on a barrage of criticisms, uh, not just in Nigeria, but globally. We're an extortionist church. We're all criminals. We're just there for the money. Now, it has not always been so. Been so. The issue is that faith response went off tangent at some point and people didn't get it. The light that developed Europe came from the church. If you go to Europe today, any of the European countries, and you're a keen observer of things or a student of history, you will see that the light came from the church. Now, the response of faith can only be accurate when faith grasps its mandate, when faith is illuminated on the purpose of God. What is the role of a church? Can I say this to you? That soul winning, transforming life is, is just a part, a part of our mandate. Jesus operated a holistic ministry. And over time, there were typologies before even the church came up. God was showing us that the church was not just interested in the man. The church was interested in his environment, in his survival. And that is the church. So when the church of faith rather, reduced his engagement of humanity to soul 
to spirituality, to preaching, it became a problem. Now, faith must go back and study the faith of our fathers. Let me use Nigeria to show you what faith response is. The first printing press in this country was set up by the church in Calabar, 1846. Now, today, I want you to see the sector, the printing sector, the publishing sector, huge, huge industry. It came out of the church. And of course, you know, the first newspaper was in Abiyokuta, uh, Harry Townsend in uh, 1854. Now, look at what people are doing at business day and all the, all the uh, newspaper houses. Now, the church had a place for a better society for the environment. I also have to say this because this will actually bring more understanding to what we're saying now that look at the health sector. In 1880, the first dispensary, what looked like a hospital in this country was set up at Obosi in Anambra State by the CMS. And of course, later on, uh, we had uh, the hospital coming up somewhere in the, in, in the West later on. Now, what will shock you is that in terms of physical things and infrastructure, the church operated from outside in. Now we operate from inside out. The church that built the hospital then had not built a cathedral. The church that set up the printing press had not built a cathedral. They built schools. They understood that people have to be educated, people have to be healthy to be able to worship. So now we turn it around, the inside out approach. If we had a hundred million, we build a church, we build structures before we, we, we do something that will reach the people. If you look at Acts of the Apostles, if you read from chapter one to six, you could see that the agrarian mainstay of that community was the church. The church was providing food. They had storage, they had farms, and they were feeding the people. They hadn't built any structure. So the, the response of faith should be for us to become holistic. I won't call it social responsibility because that is secularizing it. It is part of faith for church to operate like the church investing in the basic necessities, making sure that beyond charity, we are, we are making tangible, tangible investments like it happened. Setting the pace in industry, setting the pace in media, setting the pace in education. You know, and today, you know, you could see that in Nigeria, a lot of churches are doing very well, have some of the best schools run by churches, we have some of the best schools run by churches. So people have problems with of these initiatives will come back. So some churches have also done this, did not conserve it as a missionary outfit. So people are still struggling with pricing. But I know that as faith continues to um, get itself back, as faith captures is himself get, gets illuminated again as faith goes back to the way it is done. It will level out and uh, some of the things we are crying about in the society will no longer be there. You see, sir, in all honesty, I, I've listened to you quite attentively and I, I agree with you. And in all honesty, most preachers and Christians have argued that given the astonishing successes um, recorded by churches and mosques, if religious leaders are entrusted with the leadership of most of African countries, Nigeria and the rest, they will transform these countries just like they've done in um, churches, in the missions. And do you agree with that? Well, I would say yes and no, because you know people make statements without being specific. Um, we have two prophetic offices. We have the statesman prophet, and this is the person who could be in the altar and at the marketplace. So he's able to run a church, run facilities, facilities in the church, and he could translate that reality out there. So we have such people who can actually make that happen. 
And uh, we also have the, the priests who are altar priests, prophets who are mountain prophets, you know. Um, they could take care of the temple. They could do wonderful things within the confines of the church, but they are not anointed to step out there. So uh, the first thing is a blanket statement that a, a pastor that ran a church well can run a local government, can run a state. It's not always like that, but there are those of the calling that have the calling that actually can accomplish that. But in a deeper sense um, of appreciating that reality, the church can be part of running the state. How do we do that? It must not be a pastor stepping out of the church to go and run the church, run the, run the organization or run the, the business. It starts with the church putting structures that releases people, not just as missionaries, but as entrepreneurs, as administrators. You see, our sending power is low. It was... <laughs> He was requiring, uh, um, if you read his iconic book, The Purpose Driven Church, and there's a line I love so much. They says a church is not just known by its sitting capacity. It's also known by its sending capacity. But he stopped there. Now, I don't know if he was think, having a missionary uh, dimension, but God expanded it. Now, for us to actually build a church, our sending capacity should go beyond missionaries. The church should have structures where we should be able to send out politicians. We have to have platforms where people are groomed and they come out of the church and they enter politics and they shine like Joseph. Joseph came out of somebody's house at 17. What was Israel, Jacob, doing in that house that made him come out of that house? When you hear that, a man left Beersheba, went to shake him and then daughter and then to Egypt. And now he was very impressive as a rancher. He was, you know, heading the ranch of uh, Potiphar. He came from somewhere. So Jacob doesn't need to go to Potiphar's house, but he went there through a son. And then he goes to prison. You remember administration. He was able to reorganize the place. Now he goes to Egypt. Wow, if, I'm sure you have had my teaching on the economics of the Bible, where I brought out the five economic policies that Joseph used in Egypt. It's still what we are talking about, Adam Smith, all these people are reading. It is in Exodus, it's Joseph. You see warehousing, you see hedging, you see battering, all the monetary system. In just two chapters of the Bible, a 30 year old boy settled it. So, what I'm saying is if the church can come together and we reappraise our sending power, Sending mechanism. I love missionaries. My father was one. I lived in the mission fields all my life, you know. But for us to actually do that, the pastors don't need to. Ugochukuna does not need to leave recovery house to become the president of Nigeria. But I could groom success. I've seen some of your posters for presidency. <laughs> you know, I could groom you to become president. So let's go back to Jacob's house. That's what I'm talking about. The mystery of Jacob's house, where people step out of the church family and they bring transformation in society this is the wisdom you know i was waiting for you sir to tell me that yes the churches can run government effectively <laughs> oh, but this is the this is the wisdom this is the wisdom thank you for that answer so um moving on you there's a lot of crisis world over a lot of things are happening at the same time i, I used to tell my friends that we can't wait for government for to, to do everything because they're struggling with a whole lot with insecurity, uh, no job, and now the pandemic. So um, the government seems so confused right now. In fact, they are confused. They don't seem confused. And as a statesman, prophet, and expert in ecclesiology, what do you think will bring peace and stability to the nations? All right. I love this question. This is one of the best questions you've asked me today. Number one is we will never have absolute peace. So we would begin to live better when we accept the reality 
that nothing can be done to achieve absolute peace. So we now switch to the law of adjustment where we can learn to exist with little skirmishes here and there. You understand what I'm talking about? Being able to uh, manage a non-perfect situation. You see, from the League of Nations, if you know a bit of politics, to United Nations, there have been lots and lots of peace initiatives still today. It will never happen. It will never happen. The reason is this. Diversity is the root of acrimony. Even with, within the confines of uniformity, there will always be some kind of divergence, some kind of um, people not agreeing. So um, I'm conscious of the fact that I have a wide audience of Christians and non-Christians, but I can tell you, until the Prince of Peace comes, we will learn, we should learn to um, have some kind of peace. What kind of peace am I talking about? Peace that is built on tolerance. You know, I could be tolerating you and that could give us some harmony. So I, I don't want us to start pursuing peace now. But let's go for tolerance where you're not perfect, but I can accommodate you. The Bible talks so much about that. You know, everything is not okay, but uh, we can tolerate justice where we learn to treat people fairly. There's no peace yet, but when justice reigns, it has a way of making people shoot their sword, even if it is not permanently. Let me call it a ceasefire, you know, uh, when, when people are treated like that. Now, um, it, it, it will reduce the tensions. It will reduce, uh, it will reduce all the, the fighting and all of that. And uh, finally is um, when people are happy, they tend not to be warlike. Sadness creates instincts of battle. Anger provokes instincts of battle. So if we can have leaders that would make the people happy, and what I like, particularly the third world, is that you don't need to do a lot to make them happy. They don't really need a lot. Schools, schools, they can afford basic food. They're happy. So when, 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 when people are happy, um, it has a way of, you know, um, arresting hostilities. So this is what I think. But anybody who tells you that he has a peace blueprint, I'm waiting for it. It will not work until Jesus comes. Adversity is the root cause of acrimony. You know, I read something as you, you, you wrote sometime. You said that um, hostility is sometimes the nature of a fruitful ground. Well, oh, yeah, I uh, read that. <laughs> <laughs> this year, even in the crises that we have all around um, our Christian faith, our national growth, and all that, we can still yeah. find common ground. We can still, um, of course, grow as in we can, yeah. The continent. All right, so let's move forward on this series today. So, from a biblical standpoint, God said, I will bless those who bless the nation of Israel. What spiritual implications does this have for countries? who vote for or against Israel, Israel policies at UN and also who work against or for Israel interests? Okay. Um, people who are interested in theology will like this question. Now, um, I saw the biggest theological debate going on now globally is who is Israel? So some people define Israel as the Jews. Now, there's a second definition of Israel. Some say, no, they're the Messianic Jews. Messianic Jews are those who have accepted Christ. Then some people say, no, the, the, the traditional Jews are not Jewish. The Messianic Jews, yes, but 
that every son of Abraham, that anybody who has received Christ is Jewish. So it's a huge debate that is going on now. But let me merge three of them together to let you know that God is a God of justice. God is a God of fairness. Yes, God made a vow to Abraham that is Jewish and his descendants, us, and his descendants. He said, I'll bless those who bless you. I'll fight those who fight you. I'm going to defend Israel. But watch this. To the extent that Israel is doing the will of God. If Israel goes to the United Nations and tables a bill that is anti-God, if you fight Israel, nothing will happen to you. If Israel comes with policies that God frowns out and you fight Israel, God will not kill you just because you have fought Israel. So to the extent that Israel is working in the light of God, to the extent that Israel does propriety in their policies and in what they do, God will back them up. But for people who fight Israel when they are fighting because of God, when they're on the, on the right, um, yeah, definitely I believe that God will fight for his people because it's in the word of God. But I want to talk to every Israeli or Jewish expression, whether you are Messianic or the Orthodox traditional Jew, or you are the redeemed Jew, that's us. God cannot back evil because he's made a vow. He's a God of justice. He's dependent on doing his will, his will. So when you walk in God's will, it becomes your shield. It becomes your defense. But when you're out of his will, you're your own. All right, interesting. Okay, so let's um, discuss something that most people don't like to discuss. Preachers and um, some um, Christians. Uh, there are so, so many social media influencers right now. A lot of critics um, think that it's unbecoming of a preacher to live a life of luxury and to fly around in private jets. What's okay. your response to that? Yes, I was expecting that question. I was expecting it. And I'm so happy that I'm going to answer that question. Now, what, what people are struggling with is the intersection between necessity, vanity, and propriety. Let me explain it to you. What those three words? Necessity, vanity, and propriety. Necessity in the sense that if you grow as a preacher where an aircraft or any facility at all is requisite for the level of what you do, I mean, without it, you can't carry out your functions effectively. That's okay. But when it is, oh, I want to join the League of Jet Sets Pastors, that's vanity. You know, just because you have the money in your account or you could convince people to buy it for you, that is wrong, I condemn it. Then, proprietor, I want to explain that to you. Now, even when necessity is the case, proprietor is when you balance your books, in maintaining that facility, how does it affect where we started from? Touching lives, the role of a church, the mission of a church. So if necessity and propriety are not standing against each other in the sense that your cash flow is not in any way affected, your budget is not compromised because you want that facility, it's okay. So this is ah, my take on it. So do you have a private jet now, or would you like to get one? I don't have one. If tomorrow my ministry grows so much, and you know I'm not just in ministry. Um, you know my story. I've been entrepreneurial all my life. Um, in secondary school, I already had a company. When I was working in the bank, I had a company. I have, I'm on the board of several companies. I advise so many 
you know, so uh, people know more about my spirituality, you know. I still mean, just since I left government, I still have lots and lots of top government people around me. Uh, so if tomorrow um, the things I do, and I begin to see it on a Fortune 500 company, and I have to move around, and it will not be funded by the church, and it's necessary. Remember, it's necessary. You know, I have my hands in many pies. Uh -huh. So that's my, that's my condition. I'm not saying every pastor should be like that. That's how God has credited me. You remember when I started writing for newspaper at 21, I was really a columnist in this country, you know, as a writing column. So I've been in a lot of things. So if um, what I do grows to the point where this facility is necessary. Remember, I talked about propriety and the financing and the maintenance will not affect negatively the mandate of the church. And better still, it is not being financed from the church. Why not? All right, so some time ago, Kenneth Copeland was interviewed by Inside Magazine and a journalist from Inside Edition Magazine. So, so um, he explained what he meant by that he doesn't want to fly a commercial plane so as not to get in touch with demons. Um, you know, it's something that happens sometimes. He gave, um, he discussed during an interview with a reporter and he mentioned demons and so they misinterpreted it and stuff like that. So as a deliverance minister, do you think that being found where unbelievers are can, can reduce a believer's anointing or a preacher's anointing? Uh, first of all, did Kevin Copeland actually say that? You know, what I'm saying this is, um, Kelly Copeland is one of the, I won't call him an icon. He's gone beyond that. 50 something mm. years in ministry, no scandal. His life is intact, his marriage is intact. You could point at thousands and thousands of people, including myself, who in one way or the other that Kenneth Copeland has inspired. I mean, he's grown in God. And I don't think flesh has something to do with that man. What does he want? He's grown in God. You know, there's a point where you reach secularity and spirituality merges in your spirituality. Kenneth Copeland is right. at that dimension when on a minute by minute basis, he's in the spirit. Probably he just sees himself in the physical once in a while. So um, when such people talk, that I'm saying if he said such things, you need to sit down and subject it to analysis. If I just take out what you've said, um, it, it, there's, there's something like accommodation, distraction, and context. So I could say now, oh, I want a private retreat and I don't want anybody to disturb me. I don't want any demon to disturb me. That's because I want to do something immediately. I don't know the details, but uh, I think if he says such a thing, there must be a context. But I can tell you right here, Kenneth Copeland loves people. Kenneth Copeland has invested. It was only recently that people know that the Reinhard Bonke you hear about, all the big crusades, the major sponsor was Kenneth Copeland. So what are you talking about? He wow. gave, and not just him, most of the big, big evangelists, he's the one financing them. So if he hates people, if he doesn't like people around him, why would he spend so much to take the gospel around the world? Now to the final part of your question, um, the presence of God, that's what he just asked. Um, when light enters, that is the tradition we know in the Bible, Darkness must do what? Flee. But you know that believers, we have Jesus, but we don't have Christ consciousness. Uh, what is the presence of God? Presence of God is not the indwelling, but when the presence is remembered, consciousness. So if demons are around me and I'm a distracted saint, they will torment me, they will not, op they will not possess me, they will oppress me because the spirit inside of me is behavior. So 
if I'm not drawn to let my light shine all the time, to be in a fixed awareness of who I am, it's important I avoid demons because they could attack me. But when you train people, you know, that's been my emphasis from day one, for you to have a fixed awareness of Christ in you. Now, if you have it, a thousand demons cannot affect you. You don't even need to talk. You see me do deliverance at times. I just stand on the altar and I look and possess people and they just go. So that is what I'm talking about. But it's not everybody that has the discipline to be at that dimension. So you can uh, avoid certain settings, certain people, when you know that you are not up there. Because if you are down there, then they will feast on you. So I've grown, I've grown listening to you, and I've learned so much from you. This should be about 20 years I started I following your teachings, um, reading, your, reading your books, and watching your TV from the city of Potaco to Abana to Lagos. Uh, I've been following you, and I, I will admit that you've achieved so much um, yourself outside the church. You know, you've been in government, you've been in trade unions, and it is commendable what you have been able to achieve, even through your latest project, the Sky Leadership Academy, which is a monitoring platform that has helped over 250 people become millionaires last year alone. Please give us more details about this academy and your urban development project. Well, that's okay. What actually triggered is one is my nature. Um, I told you I'm entrepreneurial. Um, I lost my father very early at the age of 11 and uh, I had to fight. I had to work hard and to some extent I achieved some measure of success and I look back and I said because I got born again very early I got born again at the age of 15 before my 16th birthday so I've been in the Lord for a long time and I saw that this was the way to go then the Bible says we should look at Abraham if you look at Genesis 14 you saw Abraham building altars for worship Abraham building businesses. That is the model. He says he built a livestock business and a mining business. He was rich in cattle. He was rich in gold and silver. And then if you read down to verse 4, 5, he built altars and worshipped. So if we are sons of Abraham and we are not working in the balance of redemptive life, which is enterprise and spirituality is a problem. So this is where I started. Then the second thing was, I got tired of the narrative. I wanted to change the narrative about the church. The church is extensionist. But if you read Proverbs, the church was written there. It says, wisdom has built her house. Hunas has seven pillars. And Christ, what does he cry? My meat is mixed. My wine is ready. My meat is mixed and is okay, cooked. My wine is ready. The table is okay. Now, the medals just tell them to come and eat. So I knew the church had something to give. It was not given. The church was empowered to do. So I also wanted to change the narrative of the church, that the church is exceptional. You've been with me. You've never had seen me raise money one day. I've never done that. Uh, you know, and all that kind of madness. I feel that when you raise people, they will raise money for you. That's my, that's my belief. When you raise men, the men will raise you. So I believe the church takes the pace short. And that is it. And it worked out. It, it, to, last year, that's only in Port uh, the, the, my, my son, Pastor Edwin in Lagos, was giving me the statistics. I'm coming to Lagos to graduate 300 entrepreneurs in the next two weeks. You know, I'm coming to Lagos to graduate then. I just accepted the invitation from him. Now, you can imagine releasing 300 people, taking them out of poverty, taking them out of struggle, and empowering them spiritually. So we conceived this, and we didn't want it to look like something that is not uh, well structured. We've got a consultant who is a member of the church, a CBN consultant, BOI consultant. Then we started incubations. We incubated a lot of businesses. We made sure we had those businesses incubated. We looked at those businesses at nursery stage for a long time. We had lots of uh, build up lectures, preparing people. We brought people to talk. People have succeeded in one way or the other. And of course, you know my background, so I brought my pedigree to bear. And then when they were ready, we brought the consultant in. 
And of course, we subsidized, we subsidized the costs. You know, the church paid, the first one we paid 50% of a cost across the board. That's in Portaco here. The batch now we are paying 30% of it, just making sure that uh, people get into it. And of course, a heavy dose of discipleship. And we're getting results. We're getting results. So um, people are seeing the balance. Paul said in First Thessalonians, I never took anything from you that I didn't pay for. I walked with my hands day and night. I toiled. And he says, any brother that does not believe this, don't keep company with him. It was, his enterprise was so, so chibiktin and the early church that they didn't want people to hang out with people who were not having anything to do with their lives. So that's the background and it's worked so well. Now we've raised people, uh, most the branches are doing it, you know, it's all over the place. Uh, some pastors have come for training in our church and they're running the, the, the same uh, platform. Now in their churches, I'm very excited about this. I'm sure I'm gonna double that number this year. Now that I have you in the studio, I would love to keep you all day. So I have to tell our people to lock the door so that you will not go. It's difficult to catch me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I've also gotten a permission from my editor to have you at your earliest covenant on this show again. So because, <laughs> because we're, already, we're already running out of time, but we're learning a lot from but I will not let you go today until you answer my next two questions, which I will join into one. So let's go back to politics and governance, religion and governance. Should Christians yes. and participate in politics or be monarchs in communities? The second aspect of this question is, in the light of the current crisis we are having and we're looking at how the church can help, is there a is there light in biblical economic theories that can build out nations at times like this? Okay, this is a very good question. Um, the first thing is uh, the light of who we are in Christ was not fully grasped. We are priests, we are prophets, and we are kings. So what Satan did was to conceal the throne part because the throne was located outside the church. It was easy for us to accept the profile that we are within the ecclesia. So the, the, the foundation of charismatic teaching demonized everything outside the church. But the throne was outside. We have three thrones. We have the economic thrones, that's captains of industry and all of that. We have political thrones, those who are in politics at various stratifications. And then we have the spiritual thrones. And so we are supposed to reign. God does not move on it. God moves on it through his people. When success is moving now, God is on the move. That is how God moves. And the Effective move is the regal work, the gate of a monarch. Because as you're going, you're touching lives. As you're going, you're changing things. That's how God moves. The move of God is through the throne. Do you know my father-in-law? My father-in-law abdicated the throne in the 70s because he was a believer. He was supposed to be the, the traditional ruler of his community. We discuss it now and we laugh. As I wished I knew you then. So by right, all of the thrones ought to be occupied by Christians. If you look at the Bible, that was the format. That was the format. And if you go to Romans 13, if you read from verse 1 to verse 7, that scripture opens with the fact that the thrones, anybody that's sitting on the throne, watch this, belongs to God. Which means it's part of redemption. The operations there. So what happens is that when God cannot find anybody, he chooses Cyrus. He chooses anybody. And then he begins to use the person. Now, the thrones and the kingdom belong to God. That's what you read in the Bible. And he giveth it to whomsoever he wills. By me, kings reign and rulers decree justice. So it is okay for 
believers to become monarchs because it's only when the righteous is on the throne that the people will do what? Rejoice. So I'm happy you asked this question. It's a pure redemptive thing, but don't forget it's a calling. Uh, if God has sent you to that, to that area, please take advantage of it. That's also in, in, in my church. Uh, I mentor a lot of people, we, we encourage people, we find people who are called to politics, and we encourage them to go there. It's purely redemptive, it's part of God's plan, and I'm sure that what I'm saying right now, we jack some people into the reality of saying, who oh, I'm supposed to run in life. Now, finally, is that you may not actually occupy a throne. At very high, we have small, smaller thrones. Wherever you are, you should reign in life. We should reign in life. That's why you saw the journey of Joseph. He reigned in the prison. He reigned in the pit. He reigned in Potiphar's house. He reigned in Egypt. He didn't have to wait for the big throne. So we reign in life. We reign in life. So we must have that monarchical mentality. The royalty, the king priest must emerge. He must not be in the church. We must find that throne outside the church and see it as sacred. We must begin to see as sacred what is not located within the church. Thank you so much sir, for honoring my invitation. Focus Africa series today. It's been a wonderful time having you. And like I said earlier, we would love to have you again at the earliest possible time that's convenient for you. And to all my viewers from across Africa, I want to say a very special thank you. Because of time, I will not be able to take the responses from you to Facebook and our other channels. But I'm going to be directing your questions straight to Reverend Rubusku Nashku, and we're hoping that we're going to have him very, very soon back on the series. Um, the bits from the discussions today will be posted on social media handles, and we're going to get a link directly to him to have further discussions with him. Reverend, thank you so much for coming on this show. Thank you so much, my son. I'll be looking forward to having this encounter. I've enjoyed every minute of this. And also thank the business so day. I bless them. I bless them and I said they're gonna prosper. They're gonna rule the world in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. So my next guest on this show today will be discussing project management, a potential superpower for personal um business growth. Come back here at 1 p.m. I'll be live to discuss that. Thank you so much, Reverend Goshku, for coming. Thank you, Business Day, for such a wonderful time and the platform to reach out to our viewers across Africa. My name is Success Bright your host. Thank you.